love to be here with you. I remember how overjoyed I was six years ago when I heard from Paul Deuce that he was going to uh, organize the first international feeding festival. Here it's gone on, and I hope it's going on as long as it's necessary. I say without hesitation that I think accelerating a trend to veganism is the most important thing we can do today to save all highly developed forms of life on this planet. We live at momentous times, at what could be a terrific turning point in evolution. Nothing to my mind can exaggerate the importance of veganism. I'm going to doom's watch a little bit, but not for long, because actually I grow more and more optimistic. It seems clear to me that the age of predatory man and woman is coming to an end. He is destroying not only the animals, but the whole planet and himself too. He cannot go on. And the alternative is the vegan way compassion to all life, all the animals, and also to the planet, the plants, and the humans. That's the only alternative. And it is our awesome responsibility to bear the task of introducing that alternative to the <coughs> whole world. And that's why it's so important to have this international gap. in America some uh, five years ago, was it? A bit longer than that, perhaps. Attended by scientists and environmentalists, a lot of them Nobel Prize winners. Not sentimental old women, but eminent professional scientists. And at the end of their conference, their report said this, Mankind faces extinction, either in nuclear war or the destruction of the environment. What nuclear war could do in 15 or 50 minutes, an exploding population assaulting the Earth's life support systems, could do in 15 to 50 years. An ominous warning. And it summed up for me in this picture, which you may be able to see, the World Conservation Society, or other aspects of it, of the assaulting of the planet, what's happening to the planet. The World Conservation strategy was published in 1980 and went out worldwide. And I was very struck by this graphic in the popular version of it and asked permission to use it in my talks. This beginning here shows the state of three important factors in 1980. The state of the world's arable land, represented by that grain of wheat, that plant, wheat plant, the trees representing the world's forests, and the human figure. That was the relative proportions in 1980. The strategy foretold that by the year 2000, that would be the relative proportions. 
The arable lands are eroding so fast, horrifyingly fast, because of the wrong means of working them. The forests are being felled and the human population is growing. And so the conservation strategy said, by 220, that would be the relative proportions. <coughs> and they don't go any far. And the only solution is aware and compassionate living. Compassion for all life. I tend to give most emphasis in my work to the environmental matters. Not because I think any less than I ever did, way back in 64 when I turned vegan, when I heard about battery hens and veal calves. But a lot of people are doing that sort of work. So I turn my attention largely to the environment. And it's that that I feel we've got a special function our job, as I see it, again, not because I have anything but admiration for the work of people like Compassion in World Farming and Animal Aid and all these people, but <coughs> I feel that the change will only come when we get the masses of the people changing. It's no good just alone attacking the government. It's no good attacking the industrialists. The politicians will go on until they're frightened of losing the votes. The industrialists will go on until they won't sell their goods. It's the masses of people that we've got to get to. And we've got to raise their awareness. And the message we give them is the message that's been preached for thousands of years. All the great teachers have said the same thing. Compassion, love. I'm not so fond of that word because it's so loosely used, it's got so many meanings, but when I say compassion, I mean love. Loving concern for the welfare of. They've all said the same thing. And they've all been listened to because in everybody's heart there's the answering that's the answer. They know they're right. We all know that compassion and love is right. But sadly, it's not so easy to act it out. And so often the institutions that have followed the great masters have let them down. And the churches have not supported compassion, not even to humans, let alone to the animals. And it's our job to spread that widely. Sometimes I know it seems a hopeless task, especially if you listen to television much or read the media. You feel you're getting nowhere. That's why it's so encouraging to come to a gathering like this. But we are getting somewhere, and we will get somewhere just because of the circumstances. I have a quote here I'd like to read to you from Paul Ehrlich, who has worked long in the field of population. He's professor of biology in one of the American universities. Society has always had its visionaries that talked of love, beauty, peace, and plenty. But somehow, the practical men have always been there to praise the smog as a sign of progress, to preach just wars, and to restrict love while giving free reign to hate. It must be one of the greatest ironies of Homo sapiens that the only solution for the practical man today lies in what they think of 
as the dreams of the ideas. The question now is, can the realists be persuaded to face reality in time? And that's our job. And to do it, we have to do it with love and understanding and compassion. However angry we are at what men do to helpless creatures. Because anger and violence doesn't in the long run get you anywhere any more than war does. There is growing awareness, amazingly, especially as regards trees. The growing awareness of the horror of chopping, chopping down the tropical forests has done a lot to wake people up and to make them question the way we live today. There's a terrific growth in awareness of the importance of trees. But very few people realize the full significance of what trees can do for a future for life on this planet. And that is really my main topic this morning. It's summed up in the envelope stickers of which I have sold many thousands. This is an enlargement of the envelope stickers that you'll find on sale in the room over the way there. And it really sums up the heart of what I spent all my life teaching. Global warming can be reversed and people better supplied with food and other necessities if we use land for trees and not animal farming. It's not the reform of animal farming we want. It's the end of it. And in a bigger world, as I think you know, there'd be so much less land required to feed people that there could be wide areas for wildlife where animals can live their own natural lives in their own natural ways, free of our interference. Perhaps they would realize that they no longer need to fear us. And we could sometimes have the privilege of making proper relationships with them. Now trees <coughs> give us nearly everything we need. They could properly grow, properly selected. They could give us nearly everything we need. Perhaps everything we need. I had the privilege of being a personal friend of that great man, Richardson Father Baker. And you will see a video of his life, perhaps not, sometime this week. It was made just before he died at the age of 92. And I never knew which continent he was on. He'd hop from continent to continent as I would from underground to underground in London, lecturing sometimes more than once a day at 92. He spent his whole life serving the trees, as you will see in this remarkably inspiring video. And he used to say, trees will give us everything from the cradle to the grave. So he would accept the things that we dig up from the earth, the minerals and the coal. And perhaps it would be better if we'd left them there. Some of us are beginning to wonder that anyway. But not only will they give us nearly everything we need, but they can do so much to save the planet, to save it from global warming especially, but also to restore other life support systems on the planet. I'm a bit doubtful about this. Is, is it not the hearing? Aren't you hearing? Um, I'm a bit doubtful about this. I don't want to. Uh, about you. But I get shocked when I talk to people 
and I find they have no memory of the nature study they learnt in schools. I think so often, you know, we take it in, we regurgitate it onto exam papers and we have nothing to do with it. And they don't seem to understand so many of them, which is why I'm just going to mention it this morning, the carbon cycle. Only green plants can take in the carbon dioxide of the air, use the carbon to build up their bodies, and give out the oxygen. Their bodies, when we eat them, the green plants, give us all our energy, they build our bodies. And the oxygen gives us the respiration, gives us the gas we need for respiration to release that energy from the food. Trees, because of their immense size and their longevity, perform that function best of all. And because of their woody structure, they store that carbon in their wood. <laughs> the Americans got this idea, and in a way, although I'm very critical of a lot of things the Americans do, um, they were on the right tracks. They realized that if enough trees could be grown, that in itself would deal with this problem of global warming about which we are so frightened. Only trees can reverse it. And they set a scientist to do research, and he was so excited that the first paper he published was really rather silly. Because he said, if we could double the world's forests, we could take back from the atmosphere all the CO2 that's been poured into it since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in 35 years. I presume he'd done his figures right, but that was asking a bit much, although it wouldn't be impossible it wouldn't be impossible, because so many forests have been felled through the years. Oh, we get so much on our hind legs about what Brazil is doing to the Amazonian forests, but we in Europe and North America have done much worse than that in the past. England itself was once covered with forests, nearly to the top of the Cambrian Mountains. Neolithic man stopped, started to chop them down with his stone axe. Why? To make room for his grazing animals. And that's been one of the chief motives for cutting the forest through the ages, as it now has been in Brazil recently. Now, if we reforested all the land, that had been felled for the grazing animal, we probably could double the world's forests. I've got the figures in my little book that um, is on sale in the next room. But that is a bit extreme. So the next paper that Greg Marlin published said, if we planted seven million square kilometers of new forests, that would take in all the CO2 now being given out by power stations and factories. I had to clue how much 7 million square kilometers was. Will you have? It's the size of the United States except for Alaska, a pretty big piece of land. Although if you look at it on a globe instead of a flat map, it isn't quite so big. And it wouldn't by any means be an impossible thing to do. And it's being done in quite a big way. The Americans have done quite a bit of it, and they're going on doing it. It doesn't excuse them for all the excess industrialization that they're indulging in. But their contribution, as far as it goes, is valid. So that's one very important thing that trees can do. Then, I hope I'm not going too quickly. There is 
growing concern in many parts of the world about fresh water, especially in England in the southeast recently. But it's a worldwide fear, and it could be, of course, made much worse with global warming. I get people saying to me something like this, trees? I can't have trees in my garden. Look at that wretched tree next door. It takes all the water. Now there's a certain truth, there is a truth in that. Trees do take a lot of water. It does make it too difficult to grow things underneath it, some things. It depends. But the trees keep the water cycle going. And so at a distance, their benefit is very great. They're deep. Their roots go deeply into the earth, draw up the water which passes up and out through the pores of their leaves to make what one meteorologist is called oceans of the air. And those oceans of the air are wafted away, are blown away to make rain. Now if you don't have those deep roots going down, the danger is that the water table will sink beyond recall. They say there's a lake as big as Australia below the Sahara. Partly caused because the Romans chopped down all the forests in Northern Africa. So the function of trees in keeping that water table up is terribly important. I get so upset at times by clever people. People who know so much more than I do about this and this and this and this, but never connect it. They never make connections. We define compassionate living as making connections. And so not long ago, there was a United Nations decade, I think, of the water. And what were they doing everywhere? Sinking wells. Right, you sink wells, you want water. But if you sink wells and you don't grow trees to keep the water cycle going, it's like keeping on drawing money out of the bank and not putting any in. So trees and the water cycle is terribly important. So this is another point that I want to make very firmly. Trees don't do just the one thing. The trees that keep the water cycle going also help with global warming. And also they help against erosion. I showed you this picture about soil erosion, making it more and more difficult. Soil erosion, as Dr. Long would have probably have agreed this morning, is largely caused by the heavy machinery and the uh, fertilization with chemical fertilizers and the cutting down of the hedges that stop the wind. We're largely responsible for that soil erosion. We've never worried much about it in England, but there was a paper po uh, published four years ago. Uh, David Hodges, who lectures in soil biology at Wye College, the Agriculture Department of the University of London. And he said that 40% of the agricultural land of England is in danger of serious erosion. Sometimes I think this erosion is one of the most frightening things. It's so insidious, you don't notice it. But once the fertile soil is gone, you can't grow anything, you can't grow green plants, and that's the end of all the highly formed, developed forms of life on this planet. Now, one of the best means of dealing with erosion is to grow trees and to restore the hedges with the hedges, the bushes and the trees. How I wished when we had those storms that all those fences were blown over in England, some of them blown over again a couple of years later. Terrific expense the people who put them up. If only they put hedges in instead. The hedges wouldn't have blown over. 
The hedges would have taken in the CO2. The hedges would have helped protect the soil from erosion. I know it's a big garden, but still, it, it does matter. So it's very important to grow trees for erosion as well. This picture, I don't know whether you can see it from the back, but I'll put it in the next room. When rain falls on bare hillsides, there's nothing to hold it, and it rushes down the slopes, carrying the precious topsoil with it, and swelling the rivers and causing floods. When it falls through the forests, through the trees, it breaks the shock. It falls gently on the soil, and the soil debris, the leaves and the twigs, and goes down to replenish the water table. So global warming, erosion, the water cycle. And at the same time, same time, the same trees, if we grow them properly with properly selected species, can give us nearly everything we need. I knew there wouldn't be much time, so I put a little picture on your uh, seats, which reminds you of all the things that we can get from trees, and you can look at it at your leisure. I just want to pick up two things, particularly. Fuel. I'm so pleased, again, at the growing trend to realising that trees could supply the, the fuel, the energy, the fuel energy we need. Of course, it is still the fuel energy of most of the world's people. And the sad thing is, as the population of the world grows, more trees, the trees are felled for wood more quickly than they can grow. The answer is to grow more trees to take the land from the livestock, to grow more trees. If we grew enough trees in this country, this was a paper at Windscale Inquiry, one of the nuclear inquiries, presented by David Ford, and he maintained at that time that if we grew, if we grew enough trees, we could provide ourselves with uh, most of the electricity and liquid fuel as well as the solid fuel that we need. Now, a lot of people don't realise that, but wood need not be wastefully burned. If you burn it at all, it should be burned in specially constructed stoves that waste least heat and give out least pollutants. But it need not be just wastefully burned. It can be turned into electricity, gas, and liquid fuel. And there was a, a, a project at the Alternative Technology Center that the Vegan Society promoted some 15 years ago now, I suppose, showing wood chips being turned into electricity to heat the cat. And I was delighted to read in the Brooklyn Report, you all heard about the Brooklyn Report, wood is becoming an important feedstock, specially grown for advanced energy, energy conversion in developing countries, as well as industrialised countries, for the production of electricity and potentially gas, gas and gases and liquid it's been practically the only source of liquid fuel <coughs> once we've used up of the oil. So that's one very important thing we can get from the right trees grown in the right way. Ah, but I hope somebody is saying, is thinking. She talks about growing trees to take in the CO2. <coughs> but if you chop the trees down, burn them or turn them into electricity, gas or liquid fuel, the CO2 is going back into the atmosphere. Ah, but the 
CO2 that goes back is only the CO2 that that tree took in. So on that level, it's only kept things even. But more importantly, and I think I'm the only person saying this so far, so I hope I'm right, because I've had two eminent people talking about this and saying, well, yes, but it'll give us a breathing space till we get our energy policies right. If you think of the forest unit and not the individual tree, and when a tree has grown to maturity, and by that time it's storing much less CO2, it's like, you no, know, animals when they grow, it's only making enough woody structure to keep it going, it's not getting any bigger. If then the tree is felled and it's replaced, a young, fast-growing tree that's taking in CO2 rapidly. And if you think of that as part of the whole forest unit, then the forest unit is a permanent sink for CO2. If anyone would like to challenge me about that, I should be very interested to hear that point of view. So far, I haven't had it challenged. I've been saying it quite a time. Um, now I've got my papers in the moment now. So fuel. Now one other point that, of course it's a controversial point, so I'm picking up from that picture you've got, you see. Uh, clothing. Clothing can be a real problem for vegans. Of course you won't have wool and silk or leather. But cotton. Cotton. It's the passion of everybody. And yet I saw a man on television some time ago now, and he, he was from one of the African countries, and he said, I could hear his words so plainly, cotton is the mother of famine. So much land in the third world that should grow food for local people grows cotton. And not only does it do that, but the methods used destroy the soil, as Alan Long mentioned this morning. The amount of chemicals and the amount of pesticides and what the pesticides do to the wildlife and to what they do to the workers. It's always the individual contact that influences you, isn't it? Not long ago, I met an African now living in this country, who told me about his brother, a highly intelligent, healthy man who had been given a job of, of supervising the pesticide uh, dispersal on a farm. He is now like a, an idiot. The pesticides affected his brain. What do we use for clothes? We can't be nudist in this climate, can we? I mean, we want it to be. Our only temporary appearance. Well, I say wood. One of the first synthetic materials, and I remember it coming, was rayon made from wood. And there's all sorts of synthetic materials now made from wood. And trees, therefore, can give us our clothing. I know, of course, it's going to use a certain amount of fuels. And there is the very serious problem of the, po the pollutants that are poured out by the factories. But I am quite convinced that most of the pollution that comes from the factories, and there was a good article in the New Scientist not long ago on this, could be dealt with if it was profitable. except the CO2, one or two other things. So as far as pollutants is an objective to synthetic clothing, I think it can be dealt with. So trees can give us all the things we need. Trees for food. Oh, I usually come up against it, that one, when I mention it. Through the world, especially the tropics, 
There's no doubt about it that trees can produce all the food that people need. Why did they stop chopping down the trees? I could give a lot of examples, but there's not really time. But I love the bit from an African country that I did put in my little book, I think. I'm pretty sure I did. About this Gakun African who about, a, I think it said, two-thirds of his diet is from Mongongo nuts, if I pronounced it right. Yes, and he was saying, why grow crops when I can get all the nuts I want from the trees? And in Australia, there's another example, and there are countless of them, where they felled so many of the forests for their sheep farming. And recently, a research scientist had found one of the wattle trees that they felled. It gives far more protein per acre than sheep. And at the same time, it deals with a global warming, it deals with erosion, it keeps the water cycle up. And the bean trees, I have, I was no good holding it up for you because the scientists are good enough, but uh, if you'll see it up in the other room, the protein and other nutrients that you can get, the quantities that you can get from trees as compared with even cereals. For instance, the tons per hectare of cereals is four to six. Livestock will give you 0.2 tons, but walnuts will give you 29, and carrot beans will give you 49 tons The comparison is amazing. I have to remember to go into it a minute as to why people change from carrot nuts to meat from these other things to things that produce so, so much of this. Oh yes, but I, I speak to English people mostly, and they say, you can't do it in England, it's all very well, it's the fruit, the apples are nice, and the, and the pears and that, you can't live on that. But in the south of England, you can get walnuts and almonds. And the Welsh hills, now covered with sheep, that are accelerating the erosion, were once covered with hazels, with oaks, and with beeches. St. Barbara used to call the oak the cereal tree. Acorns are an excellent form of food. They're a bit high in fats, but if you cut down your fats in other ways, it doesn't matter. People say, I just can't eat acorns. They're poisonous. Well, I've got a leaflet again in the other room giving recipes for acorns and how you can easily deal with the tan, which is bitter. There are some varieties of of acorns that are not bitter. And that's coming into knowledge. I was thrilled not long ago to turn on the Tomorrow's World program. And the subject was acorns. And they showed you all these wonderful looking dishes. I think it was Thailand, I can't remember, somewhere out there. That were popular dishes made from acorns. But that wasn't why they got them on the television screen. A scientist had just discovered a previously unidentified chemical in acorns. They must have given it a great long name, but they called it acornic acid. And they found that acornic acid could take the heavy metals out of polluted drinking. I thought that was one of those amazing coincidences that makes one encouraged and feels you are getting somewhere. 
Now, all right, we want to grow vast forests, we want to go for all these things, for all these products, and also for all they do to the environment. But to do that, we shall need vast acreages, and the only place to get it from is from the livestock industry. And that is the heart, as I said, of what I'm thinking today. I have got some figures, although you'll probably get them better from my book. The world's land surface is 130 million square kilometres. 41 million are still forests. But 31 million are permanent pastures for animals. 15 million square kilometres grow food, grow crops. But a lot of that is feed for animals, not for direct human consumption. And then there's the deserts to reclaim. So though I certainly not in a way recommending it, Greg Marlin's idea of doubling the world's forests would not be impossible if we phased out livestock farming. I guess what you can't do without animal products. Forty years ago, I would certainly, or forty-five years ago, I certainly wouldn't have had the face to make such a claim. Those early vegans, motivated only by disinterested compassion, some of them were a bit aware of the health advantages of cutting out their products, but generally speaking, it was pity for the animals being so cruelly exploited that made the first vegans give up all animal products. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know how far their experiment was going to reach, how far its results were going to reach, how important it was going to be 45 years later when the world's in the state it is today. But because they invited it there, because they started to bring up their children to feed them. Now, 45 years later, we've got vegans of advanced age who can still stand on the public platform, and are generally speaking proud of their health. We've got people who are live vegans producing children of their own who are growing to teenage and beyond. We've proved it. We've proved it at every generation that Animal products are not necessary for human health. So we've taken all plea of necessity from livestock farming. What we need, I think, perhaps you will agree, almost more than anything today, is a vision of a new world very different from this one. You stopped, perhaps, so many of us, by seeing some of these dreadful pictures of what they do to the animals. And you start to reform your diet. I can't have anything to do with that. It was when I saw a two-page spread in the Sunday Observer in 64 of Ruth Harrison's book, Animal Machines, with pictures of the veal calves and the battery heads two-page spread for one review. It was obviously hit somebody hard. It was then that I turned vegan. That's what turned you. But then you start examining the whole way you've been brought up, the whole way you've been brainwashed by the society in which you've been brought up. You start to criticise everything. And you realise it's really all connected. It's the lack of compassion, it's the lack of love in the human animal that's the cause of all our troubles. At every level. And don't ever forget that in any situation, whether it's war or famine, or the destruction of the environment, it's the animals and the children that suffer most. I know some people say to me, oh, we're all on about the environment, all you care about is the, is the, is the human. That's not a big truth. It's the animals that suffer first and the animals that suffer most, and it's the animals that least is done for. So don't 
ever let me ever make that excuse of not being environmentally aware. It's largely an unbalanced evolution of the human animal, so that our intellect has grown terrifically and given us this great power over our environment. But the other side of our nature, the side, the emotional, loving side, has not kept up. I'm not anti-science, as some vegans are. Science, properly used, with compassion for life, can help to solve so many of our problems. At the moment, it's the cause of most of them, because it's not directed by compassion. It's directed by greed and fear and other negative emotions. Now, it has been suggested to me one reason why our emotional, compassionate side has fallen behind is largely because of the way we eat. Right from the beginning, if a child begins to say, oh, go dear, but you must eat it, you must eat it. And most people think you've got to exploit animals in order to keep human health. Therefore, you start to suppress the compassion compassionate side of your nature. Now once you turn vegan, once you're aware of the significance of veganism, that side can flourish again and take its place in a properly balanced human being. And that is what we're looking for, and it could happen. When we see what predatory man is doing to the whole of life, it may jerk enough people out of the habits of the ages and help them to bring compassion fully in direction of their enormous powers that they've got. Lovely time. Lovely time. So what do we do about it then? Spread the message. <clears throat> but please do it non-violently. It's right to be angry at cruel exploitation. It's right to be angry about the act, but not against the human being. You don't know what turned him that way. You don't know. I spent a large part of my career dealing with emotionally maladjusted children, and it's always something backwards in their bringing up that's caused them to go hard and you don't know what's made them. How many huntsmen were brought up from childhood by the aristocrats? Sir Evelyn Hunting. That's one direct, or rather two direct. But nearly always when children, when people grow up cruel, it's something in their background that's made them hard and cruel. And you're not going to change them by more hostility. You need to make it clear how wrong what they're doing it is. But they need psychiatry, not hostility. And they probably wouldn't thank you for saying that. <laughs> so we've got to spread the message as much as we can. I hope you'll use some of my little envelope stickers. But we've got to learn the facts too. We've got to uh, be able to uphold what we say by knowledge. And Anagon gave us a lot this morning from personal experience of things he's seen, as well as things that we can find out from books. We've got to plant trees. I was very pleased last year to be asked to be involved in the plot the Trigger for Peace movement started uh, just over a year ago. It was started by a very keen vegan and his wife, members of the movement for compassionate living down in Stroud, where these stupid bureaucrats 
had decided that a whole avenue of trees must be felled because it was stopping traffic flow. And they copied the Indians in the end, my friends, and his little group that he formed. And they actually guarded those trees day and night, all around the 24 hours. So that the people who came to fell them went back. And they saved that avenue of trees. And you know, afterwards, the bureaucrats decided there was a better way anyway. They could build a, 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 a road that would deal with the traffic flow even better. That's the sort of short-sighted stupidity that one often up against. Anyway, that little group of people that saved the avenue of trees in Stroud formed this movement for plant a tree for peace. And it's going ahead worldwide. It's only going a year. So do take it home and think about it. We've had it in India, Ireland, um, New Zealand, I think it's just started. Do take it and think about it. Plant a tree for peace. A tree planted for peace concentrates, or should if you explain properly why you're doing it, the function of trees environmentally and providing the things we need. Wars are nearly always competition for resources. And trees are the only way of, in, well, the best way, other green plants help too, of increasing the world's resources. You can go careful on the coal and the oil and the other minerals, but you can't grow more coal and minerals or oil. But you can grow more trees, trees that will give you all the things you need from the cradle to the grave and restore environmental health. And if you can get that out, it's terribly connected. I mean, one of the real danger spots in the Middle East is the competition between the Israelis and the Arabs for the water. The Israelis have some quite horrifying plans for redirecting the rivers. So trees, that the, really the only way of making more resources, and war is nearly always for resources, whatever reason you're given for a just war, it's nearly always competition for resources. So the connection between planting the tree and walls is very real. And finally, when you've done what you should, to look at all the dreadful leaflets that pour through your letterbox. And I'm not saying they shouldn't, or that you're given in the streets. Don't let it overcome you too much. Do what you can, and then put it aside, and look for hope. Hope is one of the most important ingredients for success. We've got to have hope. We've got to have hope that our strivings are really going to bring success. And I think there is hope, even in the desperation of our days, just because things are getting so bad, it's going to have to wake people up. And when they wake up, they're going to look for an alternative and have we got the alternative properly ready? Have we? This is our responsibility, to have the alternative ready. I'm particularly worried about one thing, one uh, that's going ahead a lot in this country, and I believe through Europe too, the trend to organic farming. Right. Get the animals out on the field. Get them decently treated, as most organic farmers may do. Although well, what Alan told us about the free-range hens this morning begins to arouse a few doubts of what they're going to do about their free-range cattle. But um, organic farming has got a lot to commend it. It's certainly much better for the soil. It's much better for the wildlife. They're not going to suffer from the pesticides that go through the food chain. But it depends on the continued exploitation of highly sentient creatures. 
And however nicely you treat them, what are you going to do with their male animals? And what are you going to do with the animals when they stop being producers of the things you want to sell when they get to a certain age? They're all going to end up at the slaughterhouse at an early age. And I was so pleased to hear Anna Bond talk about this business of humane slaughter. Nine people out of ten meat eaters you speak to say, oh, but our animals are humanely slaughtered. Well, I wrote a leaflet that I, that I found some four years later was corroborated by the government panel set up to examine uh, slaughterhouse procedures. This shows there's no reason at all to think that our animals don't suffer dreadfully in the slaughterhouse. Our modern slaughterhouses only increase the stress of long transport and they quiet the conscience of people who are easily deceived. So your organic farming animals are going to end up in the slaughterhouse. I had two permaculture men who had who's heard of permaculture. It's going ahead right through the world. It's got an awful lot to commend it. But they turned up on my doorstep uninvited last summer and wanted to see around my garden. Two very nice young men. I, I got an invitation to speak and another one from that. I got a lot of support. And I got a marvellous support in the permaculture magazine this month. So I was quite pleased about that. But I was nasty enough to say, oh yes, um, where are you going to have your slaughterhouses on your permaculture units? Of course, they never thought about that. They were much too nice young men. So your organic farming has got a lot to commend it. But I'm so sorry because once people go back and they get their livestock, I've got a letter I always carry with me in my file. It came to me some years ago from two young people who said they'd gone to a little smaller holding, you know, prompted for the right reasons. And they said, um, our cow has had just had her first calf. And it's a bull calf. Please, will you tell us about feeding? So, townspeople don't think about it in this do they? And if you think of all these people are motivated, organic farming and setting up their units, and they're finally they're confronted with the fact that only veganism will and an accelerated trend to veganism will solve the world's problems, environmental problems. Um, sorry, I got that. I was talking about hope, wasn't I? But there are lots of reasons for hope. Even the organic farming trend is a hopeful thing. It is a hopeful thing away from this terrible factory farm. But the general picture now, I'm quite sure, is that the age of predatory man is coming. Will a new age, in accordance with the teaching of the great, follow, or will we go right down, right there, and have to climb up the evolutionary tree again? We've all got a part to play in that. But I think generally it's hope. And if we can solve this problem of animal exploitation and spread veganism, we should also solve the problems of war and poverty and all the other things that has caused immense suffering to people and animals through the ages. Veganism is as important as that. It's a terrible responsibility. I'll end you with my favourite quote from Christopher Fry's play, Sleep of Prisoners. It is not winter now. The human misery of centuries cracks and breaks. The thunder is the thunder of the flows, the thaw, the flood, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere. Never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul man ever took. Affairs are now soul size. Where are you making for? It takes so many
many thousand years to wait. But will you wait for pity's sake? shove into people's hands, you know, in the street. But anyone who shows interest, please take as many as you think you can distribute to anybody who will read them. They're, they cost nothing. Uh, I'd like to ask Kathleen what she thinks about putting pressure on governments to buy up land and develop it logically in green belts around town and city. In Northern Ireland, we have one to two mile green belts around every sizable community. And I've been asked to sort of plot these woodlands. But the problem is, the government at the moment doesn't seem too keen on acquiring land and pushing it. Well, the first time I've had that suggestion, I think it's marvellous. I mean, land is the basis of everything. There's a book I just brought, 10 copies of the book I just bought. So not mine, it's on Tolstoy and his latest years and his teaching, not his novels. And of course, you know, Tolstoy was very interested in the land movement. Anything I could think of that could possibly help people to get back on the land, that's what matters supremely. And if you really think the government might do it, did you say it, it's being received favourably in Northern yeah, Ireland? All the towns over 15,000 population are being asked if they would plot these areas. But it's all right planning, but it's no good if you can't implement it. No. And a lot of the land that's been held publicly is now being sold off in these situations. Well, it's certainly something to work on. I think it's very important indeed. Uh, I get so upset by the young people who want to go back to the land and get can't afford it. I know at one company especially for the oh, 10 years or more, they've both been working desperately hard, saving, saving, saving. But the more they save, the more price of land goes up. And if you get a bit in the, one couple I know, in the end bought land without the house on it. Then they're in difficulty. It's terribly, terribly difficult. And I, I, I don't like to be not so hopeful, but... But the world's financial situation, as it is, there's going to be more and more tendency for the rich to go to land, isn't it? Anything we can do. I certainly think we should all take up our rights over allotments. Um, all these um, products that uh, can be extracted from trees, uh, how, how, long how, how long will it be before we can make use of them? Bearing in mind, um, you know, I think Alan did mention it himself. Uh, the trouble with trees is that it takes a long while for them to grow to maturity before you can get a return from them, which is your point, of return of any sort. Well, there has been a movement, there was an article in the Farmers Weekly not all that long ago about coppicing, coppicing poplar and, and willow for fuel, which is fairly quick. The answer to that otherwise, I think, is agroforestry or what they call adding copy. While the trees are young, you can grow all sorts of other crops between them. And you can uh, 
sometimes grow uh, crops on wood. Forest, um, Robert Hart has done a lot of work on this, and his book, I'm sorry I haven't got a copy to bring today, on forest, no, forest, forest gardening. His first book, The Shelter of Dykes, was forest farming, but that involved a lot of animals um, being used up in the trees as well, which of course I couldn't agree with at all. But you can, you can say to the farmer, there are crops you can grow underneath while the trees are reaching maturity. Although, of course, it isn't a problem so much in this country, as Anna was saying, because of the set-aside. If the set-aside land, they grow trees on it. But, of course, what do they do? When they recommend growing trees on the set-aside, they recommend monoculture of things that will grow most rapidly and bring in the profits most quickly, but not best for the environment. A proper natural forest has a mixed culture, and you don't ever do clear felling, you do selective felling. I've only an article I had read the other day about them, um, trees for fuel. If you're not careful, they'll be growing eucalyptus everywhere, because it grows most quickly, and will give you your fuel wood most quickly and most profitably. Eucalyptus is marvellous in its right place. But it's doing terrific damage in quite a lot of parts of the world. I heard of an orphanage set up in Ethiopia um, after the famine. There's so many orphans now after that famine and after those wars. And this orphanage, we really had slides of it, was very interesting. They got their little, um, well, fairly big, I, I forgot that, but it didn't say how big, that, that little, um, a growth of eucalyptus trees, which they felled, which they cut, coppiced discriminately, so that all their energy in the school for cooking and lighting and everything else was provided by their own eucalyptus trees. And in farmers in this country are producing their own electricity from their own common coppice willow and wood. So as, I'm not sure I quite answered your question because the different products would take different time. And I'm afraid I'm not up. Somebody else might be to help me on the medicines that you can get from, from trees. But in general, in general, while you're waiting for the trees to mature, then you can grow other crops underneath them. And only one part of your land would go to trees anyway. Don't want to give the impression. I mean, Sir Bart used to talk about uh, his vision of the future of villages. Again, I think I've got it here. Um, a picture of village communities of the future in valleys protected by trees on the high ground with fruit and nut orchards and also all the garden crops as well. And it's we've got to get back to that. And it could. I mean, it, the big towns are hopeless, they're dying anyway. And they're the cause of a lot of the violence. I mean, you've got vigorous young men with nothing to do. It was not out there for creative work, there'd be out there for vandalism and violence. Somehow, not dictating to them, which is what the Soviets did, not dictating to them, because anybody worth anything will go the other way if you try and push it. But somehow encourage them, and perhaps if only the government, as our friend at the back said, could be encouraged to make more land available for young people. It would be one of our inner city violence could come in with that, wouldn't it? Could be one of our solutions of the inner city violence to give young people. Oh, I know. People would say, ah, but they don't want to work. They don't want to get back on the land. I remember saying in one lecture. Uh, about Jamaica, I don't know how it came up, and about what the people want is the land back. Somebody came, you haven't forgotten, and I've got to tell it to you from science. There's an article, I hope I've got a copy in one of my ideas. It's going ahead, it's got a registered charity, and it's going ahead like mad. It, 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 it's um, uh, devoted to restoring the traditional Oh, mainly of Scotland. Oh, you'll be pleased to hear. I can give you the address if, it is, if the book isn't there, but perhaps Trevor will see if there is one. I think it was the last one, Trevor, wasn't it? Three forests in Scotland. I love it. 
Ross Main, who was assistant secretary of the Vegan Society, lives in Wales, and he's very keen and on that vegan film he showed you, working, walking through the few beautiful forests and talking about the cannabis. And you see, it has such a bad effect, because so often when you talk about restoring forests, people see those blankets of conifers, and it turns them off. Now, it's the last thing we want, apart from anything else that's so bad to the soil, as well as all the wildlife. No, it's proper mixed forests, and it, the motive must not be quick profit. But the Forest Association are coming round. I think we've, they, they are realising, they're saying today what some Bob spent his life saying, you know, about the, the, the monoculture. Monocultures of all sorts of wrong. That's what shocked me when we, we drove in this morning. I mean, it's asking for trouble to get fields that big with one crop. And we get the trouble, don't we, all of us? One of your themes is compassion. Um, I don't know. I've talked to a lot of vegans, and a lot of them became vegan kind of independently of other people. They read a book, or they saw something, or they went to a stand, and they be they became vegan because of the argument. But one of the things I wrestle with, and I have a big trouble with, is like trying to spread the message. You go to the people, you know, certain people. They seem relatively nice, um, and they pass themselves off off for intellectuals. And yet you give them the arguments, you show them the pictures, mm -hmm. and instead of responding to it, they come up with a whole bunch of half-baked intellectual arguments and shut their eyes. And I have a hard time giving anything but hate for these people. Story <laughs> 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 of my life, friend. <laughs> <laughs> I talk to meetings and I really feel I've got to win. I feel my arguments to see have, have effect to them. And then you see them looking what it costs. Give up their nice crispy bacon and their lovely milk. <laughs> so, how do you do so although I am all out for simple living and no cash crops, this is part of the movement's teaching, although I'm not dogmatic about anything, at least <laughs> I try not to be, I feel every individual person is an individual in an individual situation and you can only show them possibilities but it's for that person himself to decide what is right for himself. If you force him, it won't last long and you'll probably force forth a, call forth a hate in that person that will do harm. You can only show, you can only talk and you can only live, you can only give demonstrations, that's all you can do. And for you at your age, you see, but well, look where we've come. You see, we stayed last night in an inn. I'd written beforehand, which has always been my way, to say that we were vegans, but we didn't expect any treatment. Conference after conference during the years, I've sat there, plain boiled potato, plain boiled cabbage. <laughs> because I didn't think it did move any good, it was vegan movement any good to ask busy kitchen staff to do something special for me. Maybe they think I'm weak in sticking up for my rights. But that was always my attitude. I have ever a well, marvellous conference centre, you might have heard this, Swanwick in Derbyshire. And I used to go regularly to a peace conference there for the Society of Friends. And I always ate what I could and left what I couldn't, and that was that. But there were so many vegans there one year, that uh, we asked them to provide vegan food the next year, and they did. And the woman was a bit of a wag, and as we stood to go into the big dining hall, he said, so many tables are for the meat eaters, so many for the vegetarians, and the little table on the left <laughs> is for the really logical people that want me to get rid of my cows. <laughs> and there we sat. <laughs> it's a pity because I like to mix with people. <laughs> so things are moving fast. I, mean, I was telling you about last night. We stayed at this inn, and I said, "Please don't bother." It's just things the breakfast we had. I mean, it's as much as I normally eat. 
in the day. We felt rather, you know, rather guilty at not showing appreciation. <coughs> we had muesli and soy milk and uh, uh, toast and margarine specially bought for us and specially baked beans that we were assured were vegan and tomatoes on them. And we had a banana, and I don't eat bananas, but you know, somebody knows why. And, uh, and we had orange juice, you know, I mean, and we didn't like nothing, you didn't see what I mean. Because it was, obviously it was marvelous of them to think, it was just an ordinary pub in the town. Yeah. I said to them, really, I mean, uh, when I first turned a vegan, people wouldn't have known what I meant if I said vegan. Uh, may I ask you what are your reasons for not eating the banana? I'm not well, aware I, of it. <laughs> I try to, um, the movement tries to teach people as far as possible to grow food, to eat food that could be grown locally. Apart from the fact that so much of it is grown on land and should grow food for local people, hash crops are one of the things I really get angry about. The height of the Ethiopian famine, the first one, in 74, when we said never again, we went into Sainsbury's, I used to go to Sainsbury's, um, I picked up a packet of lentils, I've got the packet with me if you want to see it, and on it it says, produce of Ethiopia. And we'd seen the people in Ethiopia on our television screens the night before dying and watching their children die. We took the matter up with Sainsbury's, I got the answer in my file, and it said, Ah, oh, but lentils are one of the chief exports of Ethiopia, and they've exported more than usual this year because crops in the other parts of the world have failed. That turned me off restaurants. And after all, I'm told they need it for foreign exchange. And what does foreign exchange buy? Largely armaments, luxuries for the rich. Pardon? Quite often, yeah. Uh, there are, yeah. Some of it's about. Try to